Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite and I will be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about the living world. Topic for the day is going to be energy requirements by animals. So let me get you your objectives and we'll go ahead and get going. By the end of this video there are a couple things I need you to know or be able to do and here they are. First one, understand the concept of minimum metabolic rate. Second, discuss influences on metabolic rate and finally discuss the concept of torpor in terms of energy conservation sounds like rousing stuff let's go ahead and get going so first thing we need to talk about is how scientists actually measure how much energy is used by an organism first thing we got to consider is that most energy that is taken in by an animal at some point in time will be lost to heat yeah it goes to movement and building body tissue and all that but at some point in time it's going to be lost as heat, or at least most of it will. So there is a tool that scientists employ called a calorimeter. This is a calorimeter. And the concept is basically this. There is some chamber inside the calorimeter that is open and empty. That chamber is then surrounded by another chamber full of water. And what they do is they put the organism in here. Obviously, this is not a calorimeter that would be used for animals, but the idea is the same. They put an animal in the container let it sit there and do its thing. As it does its thing, it gives up heat to the outside environment, which warms the water up. As that water warms up, the scientists are able to check the change in heat, and then they can use that to figure out how much energy the animal is giving up. Remember, one calorie is roughly the energy it takes to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius. So by the <clears throat> amount of water and the amount of temperature change, they can figure out what is the uh, amount of energy that this animal is currently giving off. Which leads us to the idea of base, metabol me base metabolic rate. Sorry, words are hard. Um, if you are an endotherm, you are known to have a base metabolic rate, that is BMR. If you are an ectotherm, you have a standard metabolic rate. Now here's the difference between those two. Um, for the endotherm, what they do is they put the animal in a restful situation, relaxing, doesn't have to really do a whole lot other than sit there, and then they measure how much energy it is using in order to maintain its body temperature. Since the ectotherm's body temperature depends on its environment, they choose a standard temperature like 72 degrees or something like that, and then measure how much energy the animal is using as it stays at that one temperature. Now, it's been found that endotherms use something like, I don't know, I'm not even going to throw it out there, use a whole lot more energy on a day-to-day -day basis. Their base metabolic rate is much higher than that of an ectotherm because they're using a lot of energy to stay warm. Um, in comparison, average uh, endotherm might use like 1,800 calories per day, where a, an average ectotherm might use 60 calories a day. That's how big of a difference we are talking about in energy consumption. So something like gator, it might get by on using 60 calories a day, where a human needs probably 25, 2600 calories a day. And like I said before, most of that goes to keeping the body warm and at a stable temperature. So metabolically, there's a huge cost to being an endotherm rather than an ectotherm. Now, there are several things that can influence the base rate of metabolism, and we're just going to talk, well, this applies to all organisms, so forget that caveat that I was just going to say. The first major influence on base metabolic rate is the size. Oddly enough, whether you're talking about bacteria or blue whales, there is a very constant rate at which the metabolic needs of an organism increases. So, as a certain amount of body mass is added to an organism, it's... Uh, need for energy goes up proportionally. Now, oddly enough, organisms that are very small, like a mouse, each cell has a higher metabolic cost for them than does, say, the cell of an, el an elephant. The Like cell per cell, the cells of that little mouse will consume far more energy than the cells of larger mammals, like an elephant. Um, metabolic rates in smaller animals are much higher. Metabolic rates in Larger animals are much slower. Scientists aren't quite sure the, why that is. It might have something to do with the efficiency of chemical processes. Just know that there's a pretty constant increase and that metabolically it's tougher to be a small endotherm than it is a big ectotherm. Also, obviously, 
the rate of activity is going to have a big impact on how much energy is used. Um, human sitting in a desk is not going to spend nearly as much energy cell for cell as cheetah hunting on the savanna. So depending on your situation and how active you are, you're going to have either a higher or a lower base metabolic rate. And talking about base metabolic rates, I wanted to show you this graph because it kind of talks about how different organisms allocate the energy that they use on a day-to-day -day basis or the energy that they take in. So we got a comparison here. We've got a human, a penguin, a mouse, and then a snake. Endotherms here, ectotherms here. Size of the chart represents how many calories are used. So obviously you can see that in terms of just sheer calorie, a human might use 800,000 calories a year where a small mouse uses 4,000 and a snake uses 8,000. Now the snake, I talked about ectotherms having lower uh, metabolic needs. Notice that this snake is 4 kilograms where the female deer mouse is 0 0.025 kilograms. So looking at this chart you can see humans have got a huge basal metabolic rate. Most of the energy that we take in goes to just maintaining our body mass, heat, and all that. Same for this uh, penguin, same for the mouse, and then you can see the snake right here. This is just base metabolism. Now, as far as activity goes, it changes quite a lot. You can see humans use a fair amount for activity. Penguins use a lot more than we do for activity. This mouse, not so much. His pie chart is a little bit smaller there. And then as far as activity goes, that is a big part of the snake's energy budget. Reproduction seems to be pretty constant along all of the charts. Um, temperature regulation, you can see that that is a significant amount of the endotherm pie chart, especially our little mouse right here. You can see that his budget for keeping his body at a constant temperature is pretty big. If you notice the snake's chart, is missing that one because he doesn't have to regulate his body temperature. And then another thing that's interesting is for humans, if we are reproducing, so if this woman is pregnant, we have got energy that is used for growth and reproduction. Penguin doesn't have to worry about that one because it doesn't carry live babies. Same for the mouse. Snake does spend time or an energy making eggs. So th I just wanted to use this to illustrate that depending on what type of organism you are, your energy needs and allocations are going to be very different. Last topic for the day is going to be torpor. Torpor is a state of inactivity and lowered metabolism that is used as a survival mechanism in order to save energy. Now, we're going to talk about hibernation in a second. That is the well-known form of torpor. But there are a lot of organisms that live in environments where it gets really, really hot during the day or, you know, they need to be inactive at night. So what they'll do is they will be active, gather food during certain parts of the day, and then the part of the day where they are inactive, they will go into a state of torpor, which is not quite sleeping, but it's a really like slowed metabolic activity state where they're essentially just saving energy so that they're not sitting there burning energy really quick while they're not gathering food. Now, most of us know about hibernation. That is the situation where a lot of mammals will kind of ride out the winter in some sort of den. What happens to those mammals is they're body temperature might drop as low as 34 or 36 degrees. So their body temperature drops almost down to freezing. And they go into a state where their metabolism drops way, way down so that they are not consuming nearly as much energy as they normally would. Um, scientists have done a lot of research to see what happens with their circadian rhythms and found that at least in some species, the circadian rhythms shut down and this animal essentially just goes into this stupor for multiple months. Every couple weeks, their bodies wake up to kind of move them around a little bit, generate a bit of heat, maybe take in a little bit of food. But for the most part, these animals will be in a state of near freezing for multiple months and that is all so that they can ride out the winter, save some energy, and then as spring comes along, their bodies will rouse out of that state, they will start normal activity, and be good to go until the coming winter. So it's kind of an interesting strategy for maintaining, um, I guess, energy reserves. So that's what we got on energy requirements. Thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. Hopefully we'll see you again.